Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the general principles of law and in this lecture we shall have a look at crimes and civil wrongs. So we have seen before that law is divided into criminal law and civil law. Now criminal law deals with crimes and the civil law deals with the civil wrongs. So in this lecture we are going to explore what is a crime and what is a civil law civil wrong. So what is a crime? The term crime has not been defined in any statute. We have seen before that a statute is a written law that is promulgated by a legislature, either a parliament or a state assembly. Now there is no statute that defines this word crime. And why? Because it is difficult to define. Jurists, social scientists, criminologists and thinkers have endeavoured and evolved different definitions of crime, each emphasising a particular aspect of crime and looking at crime from a particular angle. So different people, jurists, social scientists, criminologists and thinkers, including philosophers, they have worked on the definition of crime, they have thought about it, they have developed theories about crime. But none of these is a perfect definition because you can look at crime from different angles and each of their definitions would highlight a certain aspect of crime, but it will not be the complete definition. So many people have worked on it, but all of their definitions are emphasizing some particular aspect of crime, looking at crime from certain particular angles. None of these definitions appear to be very precise and fully satisfactory. And so we can say that crime is what a particular society at a given time says it is, so it reflects the value of the society. So what is a crime and what is not a crime? It depends on the society. There can be a situation that there is a particular offence that is a crime in India, but say not a crime in the United States. Or you can have something that is a crime in the United States, but is not a crime in the United Kingdom. So it depends on the societies. It depends on the values of the societies. Now values of the society are derived from a historical point of view. What has been the history of that particular society? What has been the culture of that society? What kinds of thinkers have there been in that particular society? And with the passage of time, these values keep on changing. So something that was not a crime before can be made criminal and something that was criminal before can no longer uh, stay a crime. Now in this course we will look at the Indian Penal Code which is basically a set of rules or all the statutes and laws and rules that signify what are crimes, what are the offences, what are the punishments in the Indian context. And when we go through that module, we will see that there are several sections that have been omitted over the time. So there were several things that were offences or crimes before, but they are no longer crimes in today's context. Similarly, many sections were added. So things that were not crimes before became crimes later on. So crimes are a reflection of what the particular society is thinking about. What are the values of the society? So crimes are a reflection of that. So we will look at some definitions of crimes. Blackstone says that a crime is an act committed or omitted in violation of a public law forbidding or commanding it. So a crime is an act. A person has to do something. 
merely thinking about something is not a crime you have to do something so there has to be a physical act so a crime is an act now what kind of an act it can be an act of commission or an act of omission when we say an act of commission it means that you have done something you have actually done done something and by doing that thing you have violated a particular law but you can also have a crime of omission so in a crime of omission you did not do something that you were required to do so that is a crime of omission so you can have crimes which are acts that are either committed or omitted and both of these things commissions and omissions are violation of something violation of a public law now public law means a law where one of the parties is the state it is a law that all the members of the public have to follow if a public law is violated then it becomes an affront to the whole society it becomes an affront to the government and even if the person whose rights have been violated even if that person is no longer alive or even if that person does not want to go through uh, uh this proceeding then to the state will take up his place so when we look at crimes that uh, or cases that go something like the crown versus such and such person or the state versus such and such person or the government of gujarat versus such and such person or the r versus something r stands for the king or the queen the queen versus somebody the king versus somebody so in all of these cases there are no not two people who are involved so it's not a case where a has violated the rights of b and so b is suing a no these are violations of public law and so the whole public or the whole society or the whole government or the whole state is going to fight this case so crimes are acts of commission or omission in violation of a public law if you have acts of commission or omission in violation of a private law then you won't call it a crime you'll call it a civil wrong now these acts are being committed or omitted in violation of public law forbidding or commanding it that is if the public law says you are forbidden to do this you are not allowed to do this and you do that that is a crime or if the public law commands you to do something you are required to do something and you do not do that then too it becomes a crime so this is blackstone's definition sir james stephen says crime is an act which is both forbidden by law and revolting to the moral sentiments of the society so sir james stephen is highlighting the fact that for something to be crime for an act to be crime it should be forbidden by law so this is what is being said here but in sir james stephen's definition you don't have the acts of omission so it he just says an, an act that is forbidden by law but he also adds something and revolting to the moral sentiments of the society which means that if there is an act that is forbidden by law but is not revolting to the moral sentiments of the society then in this definition we will not call it a crime for example if we look at the salt act and if we consider the fact that salt being a very essential ingredient of everyday diet if gandhi ji went and took up salt during his dandi march then he did something that was forbidden by law but it was not revolting to the moral sentiments of the society in fact it was in consonance with it was directly supporting what the moral sentiments of the society were saying that is a large number of people are getting impacted negatively because the government has prohibited the manufacture of salt the government is regulating the manufacture of salt the government is uh, prohibiting without uh, payment of 
huge amounts of taxes, the movement of salt. And this being such a basic ingredient, the society was very much oppressed by this law. So when Gandhiji violated this law, when he did the act that is forbidden by law, but it was not revolting to the moral sentiments of the society, then as per this definition, we won't call it a crime. So, even though it is a violation of a law, it is a violation of a statute, but this is not a crime. Now, this definition can raise certain questions. What are the moral sentiments of the society? How do you define if your act is revolting to the moral sentiments of the society? what fraction of the society needs to revolt. That is, if there is a situation that it is revolting to 50% of the society and it is not revolting for 50% of the society, then where would you put it? What is the figure? What is the cutoff? If something is highly revolting to 30% of the society, how would you deal with it in this crime, in this definition? So, this definition is highlighting the fact that the society has a say, but it is also bringing in certain complications. Next, Professor Kenny says, crimes are wrongs whose sanction is punitive. We have seen before what is a wrong? A wrong is a violation of a right. So, every right has a corresponding duty and if the duty is not done, then a wrong has been committed against the person who has the right. So, crimes are wrongs. They are violation of rights or they are violation of duties or not doing the duties. But not just any wrong, but a wrong whose sanction is punitive. Punitive means that there has to be a punishment. So, only those wrongs that are punishable by law, they would become crimes. But any wrongs whose sanction is not punitive, if you do not have a punishment, you do not have a crime. Now, we saw this before that to safeguard the rights of individuals, to safeguard the rights of citizens, the government comes up with a declaration of rights, but the law also has to specify what all wrongs can be done in violation of those rights and has to make them punishable. Now, this is the fact that Professor Kenny is highlighting. Crimes are wrongs whose sanction is punitive. So, the society has to define these wrongs and sanction a punishment for them and is in no way remissible that is pardonable by any private person but is remissible by the crown alone, if remissible at all. Now, in today's context, we can say, but is remissible by the government alone. So, basically, what this definition is highlighting is the fact that if A has certain rights and these rights were violated, so B violates these rights. So, in this case, A is suffering and B is causing the suffering or causing the injury in legal terms. Now, if this act is to be a crime, then A must not be able to forgive B. So, this forgiving or pardon should not be there. The pardoning of this act can only be done by the government or the crown or the sovereign. If A is able to forgive this crime, then this is not a crime at all. So, this is what Professor Kenny is highlighting. Crimes are wrongs whose sanction is punitive and is no way remissible or able to be pardoned by any private person. Even that person whose rights have been violated, but is remissible by the crown alone, if remissible at all. So, that this is another aspect or another viewpoint of crime. 
then halsbury's laws of england say that a crime is an unlawful act so this is an act or a default so here again we are talking about commissions and omissions so act is a commission default is an omission so a crime is an act or a default that is unlawful that is there has to be a law that says that you must do this or you must refrain from doing this and the person is violating that so it has to be unlawful there has to be a law so a crime is an unlawful act or default which is an offense against the public so when we say offense against the public we are again coming back to this portion it is pardonable not by any private person but is remissible by crown alone if remissible at all so either these things because these are against the society against the public so either there is is no pardon or the pardon can only be done by the government so this is an offense against the public and renders the person guilty of the act or default liable to legal punishment so according to this definition there has to be an act or a default which has to be unlawful so there has to be a law about it and this unlawful act or default has to be an offense against the public at large against the society at large not just against a person and it should render the person guilty so there has to be an enforcement of the law if the law is not being enforced then we will not call it a crime so it should render the person guilty of the act or default liable to legal punishment so not only should the law say that this is a violation but the law should also prescribe a legal punishment so with if all of these criteria are met then we'll call it a crime now in all of these definitions one thing is clear that all of these definitions are highlighting a certain aspect of crime so we can understand or we can have an intuitive understanding of a crime by looking at all these different definitions but then none of these definitions is complete because even if we look at this definition of halsbury's laws of england then if there is a law that says that such and such thing is a crime but does not provide a punishment what will we do then does the act or the omission not remain a crime if it is not punishable so these are the things that we have to think about now while a crime is often also an injury to a private person which has remedy in a civil action it is also an act of default contrary to order peace and well-being of the society making crime punishable by the state what does it say a crime is often also an injury to a private person meaning that in this particular case because b has violated the rights of a so this is leading to an injury to a private person so when we say injury to a private person in this particular case a has suffered an injury so he is suffering an injury so this same act is an injury to a private person but and this injury may even have a remedy in civil action that is a may be able to sue b for damages and when a person is suing another for damages it is a civil action so a crime is often also an injury to a private person which has remedy in, in civil action but it is also an act of default contrary to the order peace and well being of the society meaning that if we talk about crimes then it is not just a person who is injured but the society at large also gets injured so it is contrary to the order of the society the peace of the society the well being of the society for example if 
a person robs another person if say if we say that b robs a so a is suffering an injury a is injured but the whole society the society also gets injured by this act of robbing now why do we say that the society is getting injured because now people will be in a greater amount of tension people will be in a greater amount of worry people will be in a greater amount of anxiety the whole society will have to take measures people will have to say procure bigger locks or go for more advanced security measures so basically there is a disturbance to the society by this act of b robbing a and so there is this particular act becomes contrary to the order peace and well being of the society earlier the society was having a, a higher amount of well being because people were feeling secure but by this act by b robbing a this well being has been impacted and it is this injury to the society that makes it makes a crime punishable by the state so the state takes the side of the society and on behalf of the society the state is going to punish this crime now there is also this marxian hypothesis of crime so we have seen that the crime includes something that is against the society but karl marx had a very different view about crime so of course these views with time they have been diluted but nandilas they are interesting because they are again another view point of crime so karl marx says that an act is criminal because it is in the interest of the ruling class to to define them as such so basically what karl marx is highlighting is that you in a large number of crimes we are not looking at the interest of the society but we are only looking at the interest of the rich class the bourgeoisie so karl marx is saying the act is criminal because it is in the interest of the ruling class the rich people to define them as criminal so this is also a view point persons are labeled criminals because so defining them serves the ruling class so a large number of laws are made just to serve the ruling class and in one of the later lectures we will look at such acts so there have been acts that were passed by different legislatures and parliaments that stated that the ruling class if the if the ruling class comprised of europeans then it made laws that were serving the interests of the ruling class so this has happened in history it may even be happening today in some bit, in some places where the ruling class makes a set of laws for its own benefit however fancy these laws may be so for instance if the nazi party had to uh, advance its ideology it made certain laws to self its own ideologies and we'll see in a later lecture that this is why the powers of the legislature have all have always to be kept within bounds you cannot give the legislature a free run but what marx is highlighting here is that there are certain laws that make certain acts criminal that label people as criminals just because it serves the interests of the ruling class and this is one reason why crime varies from society to society depending on the political and economic structure of the society so the same offense may be a crime in one society and may not be a crime in another society because it depends on the political and economic structure of the society even if there is one society that changes with time then there will be certain things that will become criminal acts and there will be certain things that will no longer remain crimes 
this is again something that we will see when we discuss the IPC as well. Several sections were inserted, several sections were removed and a large number of these changes were done after independence. So, before independence the ruling class was the Britishers. So, they made laws, they made, they defined crimes and they prescribed offences in a way that best suited them. And with independence, when we had our own government, then the laws were again relooked into, taking into account the best interests of Indians. So, this is what he is highlighting. Crimes vary from society to society depending on the political and economic structure of the society. If the political structure changes, if the economic structure changes, then some things that were not crimes before will become crimes, some things that were criminal before will no longer remain crimes. For example, a more recent case would be the case of liberalization, privatization and globalization that India was ushered into in the early 90s. Before that, we had a period that is known as the license Raj. So, if you wanted to do anything, if you wanted to set up a business, if you wanted to expand your business, you required a license for that and not having a license and creating your industry or expanding your industry was a criminal offence. But when the economic structure of the society changed, when the whole economy was liberalised, we just gave away with those statutes. We said that licences will now no longer be required. It is known as the process of de-licensing. So, the same act that was criminal before is now no longer criminal because the economic structure of the society has changed. So, crime varies from society to society depending on the political and, and economic structure of the society. And the fourth point in Marxian hypothesis is that crime directs the hostility of the oppressed away from the oppressors and towards their own class. That is what Marx is highlighting here is that in a society there are certain people who are the ruling class and there are certain people who are the oppressed class that are the people who are being ruled upon and by defining crime the hostility of the oppressed class. So, if say we have a situation that you have a ruling class and the ruled class and the ruling class is oppressing, that is it is taking an undue advantage of, it is harassing the ruled class. So, one point that defining something to be criminal helps is that any hostility that the ruled class has towards the ruling class, so if there is any hostility that these people are oppressing us, this hostility is redirected towards the ruled class itself. Because certain people when they are labelled as criminals, so if somebody is labelled a criminal then there will be a hostility towards that person by the ruled class itself. And so, some amount of anger, some amount of vengeance, some amount of hostility gets redirected away from the oppressors and towards their own class. So, this is the Marxian hypothesis of crime. Now, when we talk about crimes, there are two elements of crime. You have a physical act or actus reus. So, there is a physical component, you have to do something which is a forbidden deed. Actus reus means a forbidden deed. And there is a mental component that is known as mens rea or a guilty mind. Now, just having a guilty mind is not a crime because you have to express it somewhere through a physical act. The least that you can do is to popularize your guilty mind. You can talk about it, you can write about it, you can do a propaganda about it. But when you do these things, you have also committed a physical act which is actus reus. So, just having a guilty mind is not a crime because 
you cannot look into the minds of people. So there is no way we can say whether a person has a guilty mind or not, if he or she has not done anything. But at the same time, just doing the physical act that is actus reus does not make something to be a crime. So, Professor Kenny says that actus reus means such result of human conduct as the law seeks to prevent. So, here again what he is saying is that it is something that is forbidden, it is something that the law seeks to prevent and if a person does this forbidden deed, then that is actus reus. It is the result of human conduct as the law seeks to prevent. It is constituted by the event and not by the activity which caused the event. It is caused by the event, not because of the activity. For example, the death of a person is an event, which may be caused by the activity or conduct of firing a gun. So, in this case, what is actus reus? Actus reus is death of the person, killing a person. That is actus reus, not firing the gun. So, if you kill the person, not by firing a gun, but by asphyxiating the person or by poisoning the, fun the person, all of these constitute the same physical act of killing the person. So, how you do it is not that important. Actus reus may consist of both consequences and circumstances. So, there are consequences and there are cer certain circumstances in which these consequences were attained. For example, death of a human being does not always constitute a murder since the act alone is insufficient. The act and intent must combine together to constitute the crime and this intent gives you the mental component or mens rea. So, basically just the death of a human being does not always constitute murder. You can also have things like manslaughter. So, that is different from a murder. You can also have things like accidents. And in some of these cases, in cases such as self-defense, so if you kill somebody in self-defense, here again you have killed somebody. But it does not make you guilty. You have not committed a crime. Because there are certain circumstances of this consequence. So, just this death or killing is not murder because the act is not sufficient. You have to look at the circumstances in which this death occurred. Was it a pre-planned thing? Was it an accident? Was it something that you did in self-defense? So, this is the circumstance of the same consequence of killing a person. And this circumstance brings us to mens rea or guilty mind. Now, mens rea is an essential ingredient of crime. If there is no mens rea, there is no crime. There must be a blameworthy condition of mind. So, there must be a condition of mind that you can put a blame to. There has to be an intention to do this crime. Otherwise, there shall not be a crime. And this is subject to certain exceptions that we will look into throughout this course. Now, this is an example, you brought your umbrella, but on leaving the class, you took someone else's umbrella, believing it was yours. In this case, you did not commit a theft, since there was no mens rea. So, if we talk about the crime of theft, it requires actus reus and mens rea. In this case, you had an actus reus, you did a forbidden deed. You took away somebody else's property, but there is no mens rea, there was just a confusion. You did not have an intention that let me take the umbrella of one of my classmates. You never had this intention. Now, intention is not the same as motive. Motive, motive may be an underlying thing, but intention has to be there. If you do not have an intention, if you do not have a guilty mind, you have not committed a crime. Now, this equation holds good in respect of all conventional and traditional crimes. That is, crime is actus reus plus mens rea. 
Now, why do we say in respect of all conventional and traditional crimes? Because even not having actus reus, even not having mens rea, even not having both may also make you liable to something. For example, if you are setting up a factory and in this factory you are storing something, you are storing say a very poisonous substance, a toxic substance. And the whole of the establishment is being has been outsourced. So, you have given the contract to somebody else. Now, in this case, if the gas leaks out, so it is not your fault. You have not led to the leakage of the gas. You did not have a mens rea. You did not want to kill the people in the surroundings. But even though you do not have any actus reus or mens rea, but still you will be held accountable through the law of torts. So, this equation that crime is equal to actus reus plus mens rea holds good in respect of all conventional and traditional crimes, but as always we have certain exceptions. Now, this is all about crime. What is a civil wrong? What is a civil law? Now, civil law is the positive law of the land or the law as it exists. Now, we have seen that positive does not mean that this is the opposite of negative. Positive means as it stands, something that has been posited or put forth. So, if something exists and we say that, okay, this thing exists and so will take it on its face value, then that is positivism, taking something at its face value. And civil law is the positive land of the uh, law of the land or law as it exists. Civil law is in the form of enjoyments or prohibitions for people who inhabit a particular state. So, civil law, what does it say? It says people are prohibited from doing such and such things. These prohibitions are backed by the force and might of the state for the purpose of enforcement. Civil law is territorial in nature applying only within the territory of the state. So, that is civil law. And an infringement of the civil law, that is an infringement of the positive land law of the land leads to certain attachments or fines or imprisonment or damages or certain other forms of punishment. So, there can be attachment, say attachment of property, attachment of bank accounts, it may lead to fines, it may lead to imprisonment, it may lead to damages or some other form of punishment. Now, this punishment is a display of the displeasure of the society inflicted upon the wrongdoer. So, why do you have this punishment? Because this is a display of the displeasure of the society that is given to the wrongdoer. The legal maxim in this case is ubi just ibi remedium. Where there is a right, there is a remedy. To correct the wrong connected with the right. So, why do you have a remedy? To correct the wrong that is connected with the right. And remedy, that is the word remedium, it signifies a right of action. It means deliverance from some hardship, burden or grievance, legal redress or remedy for wrongs or injury. So, basically you have criminal law and you have civil law. In the case of criminal law, there is only a punishment. But in the case of civil law, you can have Things such as attachments, fines, imprisonment, damages or some other form of punishment. Now, to give life to the civil law, we have things such as specific reliefs. Specific relief is a relief granted only for the purpose of enforcing individual civil rights and not for the mere purpose of enforcing a penal law. So, when we talk about specific reliefs, 
we are not talking about penalties we are not talking about the punishments that are to be given to a person but we are talking about the enforcement of individual civil rights so the civil rights of each and every individual or the citizen to enforce that you have certain uh, laws that come in the category of specific reliefs in india the specific relief act 1963 is the law relating to certain kinds of specific relief now in the case of these specific reliefs the objective is not to punish the offender but to enforce the civil rights of individuals so if something has gone wrong how do you correct it the specific reliefs covered by the specific relief act of 1963 are recovering possession of a property so basically if somebody has committed a theft so somebody took over your house so he or she has committed a crime so he or she has to be punished but at the same time your rights of possession and enjoyment of your house also have been violated so there also is a civil wrong now to right this wrong you will be given a recovery of the possession of the property that is the property will be taken away from the person who has usurped your property and the property will be given back to you you will recover the possession of the property now this portion of law that is giving you your individual civil rights that is enforcing your individual civil rights by giving you back the possession of your property comes under the specific relief now in this case when we talk about civil law there can be a large number of these things you can have imprisonment damages other forms of punishments but the objective here is mainly to give you back your individual civil rights it is not just to punish the person so if the court says that you have to give back the possession of the property to such and such person and if you do not give it back then there will be consequences but these consequences are not because the act is an affront to the society but these consequences are because the court has to enforce the civil rights of certain individuals so this is a distinction that you have to keep in mind crimes are offenses against the society civil wrongs are offenses against a person so criminal law deals with punishments so that the rights of the society are enforced civil law deals with specific reliefs also including certain punishments so that individuals rights are enforced what are the other kinds of reliefs specific performance of contract that is if two people have made a contract and one of them says i am not going to fulfill it so the court can say that no you have to do this specific performance of contracts so that the individual civil rights of the other party are enforced rectification of instruments that is changes or corrections of the instruments rescission of contracts cancellation of instruments declaratory decrees and preventive reliefs such as injunction so let us now look at all of these in more detail to understand what all of these are now section 5 of the specific relief act says recovery of specific immovable property a person entitled to the possession of specific immovable property may recover it in the manner provided by the code of civil procedure 1908 so there has to be a person and the person should be entitled to the possession of what a specific immovable property then only this section is going to apply so it is applicable for specific immovable properties and a person who is entitled to the possession of that specific immovable property may recover it that is he may get it back how 
through the procedure that is given in the code of civil procedure. We will look at the code of civil procedure in more detail later on. But for this particular section, there has to be a person entitled to possession. So, it must be established. We looked at things like titles. So, there must be a title with this person that says that, okay, this is my property. I hold the rights to this property. Only then this person becomes entitled. So, this person should be entitled to possession of a specific immovable property. And in that case, the recovery can be made in the manner provided by the CPC. Section 7 of the Specific Relief Act talks about movable properties. Basically, it is the same. Recovery of specific movable property. A person entitled to the possession of a specific movable property may recover it in the manner provided by the Code of Civil Procedure 1908. So, here again, as before, there has to be a person entitled to possession. So, he must be able to establish his title over this specific movable property. And this possession should be of a movable property. Only then this section will apply and the recovery should be in the manner provided by the CPC. Then section 14 of the Specific Relief Act talks about contracts that are not specifically enforceable. So, it is not that all the contracts are specifically enforceable. When we talked about this relief of specific performance of contracts, then it does not extend to each and every contract. So, there are certain contracts that are not specifically enforceable. So, the court will not say that you have to do this. What kinds of things? Where a party to the contract has obtained substituted performance of contract in accordance with the provisions of section 20. So, if a person has obtained a substituted performance of contract, that is he has substituted the original performance of the contract with something else. Then because he has already obtained a, a, a substituted performance, so the court will not then ask for the specific enforcement of the contract. A contract, the performance of which involves the performance of a continuous duty which the court cannot supervise. So, for example, if a contract says that you have to give a property A to a person, so this contract can be specifically enforced because the court can say that, okay, you have to give this property to this person. You are mandated to do it. But if a contract says that for the next 50 years, this person has to work in your factory. Now, in this case, the court cannot enforce or supervise this act for the next 50 years because it requires a continuous supervision. So, in those cases, there will not be a specific enforcement of the contract. So, it should not involve a continuous duty which the court cannot supervise. A contract which is so dependent on the personal qualifications of parties that the court cannot enforce specific performance of its material terms. So, for example, if a contract says that a singer has to sing in a very melodious tune, then asking the singer to sing is okay. But if you ask him or her to sing in a very melodious tune, this is not something that the court can enforce. Because in this case, you have a contract that is dependent on the personal qualifications of the parties. And in these cases, the court cannot enforce specific performance of its material terms. A contract which in its nature is determinable. Determinable, the word comes from the term terminable. That is something that can be terminated, something that can be ended. So, determine is to bring or come to an end, thus one which can be revoked, terminated or made void by either party or due to the happening of an event or exigency. So, if there is a contract that has these clauses that make it voidable or that make it endable, by one or more of the parties or because of certain things that have happened. 
so in those cases the court is not going to ask for a specific performance of that contract then section 26 talks about the rectification of instruments so rectification is changes or corrections in an instrument when through fraud or a mutual mistake of the parties a contract or other instrument in writing not being the articles of association of a company to which companies act 1956 applies does not express its real intention so when does this this section apply when there is a written contract or a written instrument that does not express its real intention why because there was a fraud somewhere or there was a mutual mistake of the parties so it can be because of fraud or because of a mutual mistake a bona fide mistake but if this contract is not expressing the real intention then either party or his representative in interest may institute a suit to have the instrument rectified so the parties to the contract can go to the court and start a suit asking for corrections to this instrument or the plaintiff may in any suit in which a right arising under the instrument is an issue claim in his pleading that the instrument be rectified so the plaintiff that is the person who is bringing in the case may claim in his pleading that the instrument should be rectified or a defendant that is the person against whom the suit is brought forward so the, the defendant as is revert, referred to in clause b may in addition to any other defense open to him ask for rectification of the instrument so what this section is saying is that if there is a mistake in an instrument either a contract or certain other written instruments such that it does not express its real intention then either party may go to the court the person who is bringing it up may say that this instrument should be rectified because of such and such problems and the person who is the other party may also say in addition to any other defense open to him so this person might defend that no this contract is correct but this person may also say that okay let us go for a change in this instrument so in this case the instrument may be rectified next we have section 27 of the specific relief act when rescission or revocation may be adjusted or refused so the parties can also say that no we do not want corrections we want to revoke this whole contract and how is that taken care of any person interested in a contract may sue to have it rescinded and such rescission may be adjusted by the court in any of the following cases namely where the contract is voidable or terminable by the plaintiff where the contract is unlawful for causes not apparent on its face and the defendant is more to blame than the plaintiff that is the person in the contract who is bringing up, up this case can show that this contract is voidable or terminable by this person by himself so he can go to the court and say that i have the rights as per this contract to make it void or to terminate this contract so please do this or if the contract is unlawful so it is breaking some law for causes not apparent on its face and the defendant is more to blame in this particular case so the plaintiff is bringing this case to the court that i want to terminate this contract because this contract is unlawful and it is unlawful because of the defendant then the court may end this contract notwithstanding anything contained in subsection 1 the court may refuse to rescind the contract now it is not necessary that the court should always agree to terminate the contract the court may say that if the plaintiff has expressly or impliedly ratified the contract so it is not the case that you can always go to the court and say that i want to terminate the contract if you have ratified the contract if you have read and approved the contract whether expressly or impliedly then it is also your fault 
where owing to the changes of circumstances which has taken place since the making of the contract not being due to any act of the defendant himself the parties cannot be substantially restored to the position in which they stood when the contract was made so basically the circumstances have changed a lot not because of the defendant so the defendant may say that okay the circumstances have changed but not because of me so in those cases the court will not rescind the contract where third parties have during the subsistence of the contract acquired rights in good faith without notice and for value so because of the contract there are third parties who have acquired rights over something and for value so they have paid for it so if the rights of third parties are involved then you cannot terminate the contract by yourself you have to bring the third party also in consonance and where only a part of the contract is sought to be rescinded and such part is not severable from the rest of the contract so if you say that only this small part should be terminated but it turns out that this small part cannot be severed or removed from the rest of the contract then the court can say no section 31 cancellation any person against whom a written instrument is void or voidable or who has reasonable apprehension that such instrument if left outstanding may cause him serious injury may sue to have it adjudged void or voidable and the court may in its discretion so adjudge it and order it to be delivered up and cancelled so if there is something against you that is void already void or it is voidable and you have an apprehension that somebody may misuse this document so you can go to the court and you, and the court may order that it should be delivered up to the court and it should be cancelled if the instrument has been registered under the indian registration act 1908 the court shall also send a copy of its decree to the officer in whose office the instrument has been so registered and such officer shall note shall note means has to note on the copy of the instrument contained in his books the fact of its cancellation then section 34 discretion of court as to declaration of right or status so any person entitled to any legal character or to any right as to his uh, as to any property may institute a suit against any person denying or interested to deny his title to such character or right and the court may in its discretion make therein a declaration that he is so entitled and the plaintiff need not in such suit ask for any further relief provided that no court shall make such a declaration where the plaintiff being able to seek further relief than a mere declaration of title omits to do so that is if you are entitled to something and there is somebody who is saying that you do not have the rights to that so you can ask the court to declare that you have these rights then we have preventive relief preventive relief is granted at the discretion of the court by injunction temporary or permanent that is perpetual so injunction is basically a command of the court to ask somebody to do something or to refrain from doing it and you can have temporary injunctions that continue until a specific time or an order and this may be granted at any stage of the suit or you can have perpetual injunction that is permanent injunctions that can only be granted by the decree made at the hearing and upon the merits of the suit the defendant is thereby perpetually enjoined that is he can for all times he can be prohibited from the assertion of a right or from the commission of an act which, which would be contrary to the rights of the plaintiff so these are the specific reliefs that can be granted under the civil law so in this lecture we had a look at crimes we had a look at civil laws and we also looked at specific reliefs that can be granted so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind